in climate change uh, policy. And uh, so, of course, we'll be having discussion uh, and question uh, after. So, welcome, Alfonso, and uh, thank you for agreeing to talk uh, to us today. I think some of you already knew Alfonso. Thank you. Thanks, Pascaline. And um, I have to sit very close to the plankton. This is with me. Um, okay, so the topic today's uh, presentation is uh, your opinion as a front runner on climate change policy. Often, in fact, um, those two words highlighted in italics are uh, I've rendered as a leader, the EU as a leader. I prefer to use front runner for reasons that we will see through the, through the lecture. Uh, a leader is sort of implied leading other people, not just running ahead of them. And we'll see that perhaps the European Union. Um, so the European Union seems to be just perhaps running ahead, but not so much lead. We'll see what that means. Um, so uh, I divided the lecture in two sections. As I mentioned to a couple of you that already um, saw me on Wednesday, a lot of the topics are the same, so I'm going to be saying the same things. So I apologize in advance. Um, the two sections are the international level, so the European Union acting um, in front of mainly the most important countries, China, US, Russia, but also as part of the developed group, uh, as part of the developing group of countries. Uh, that's an important division in the climate change um, international diplomacy. And then we'll look at a couple of policies uh, within the, the borders of the EU that uh, sort of back up the, the European Union status on the, on the diplomatic arena. Um, so starting with the international political debates around climate change, first off we have to introduce well where, where these things happen, where this debate happens, and why it happens. Um, why do we think climate change is a, is a problem in the first, first issue? And well, um, I've just got here a very a uh, very short timeline to put everyone up to speed. Obviously, I'm not uh, entering into a lot of detail because there's not, not enough time, but let's just say that from the 19th century, we've known that um, carbon dioxide, CO2, and other gases um, keep the air warm. We've known that for a very long time. Now, the problem was that around the 70s, we started realizing that maybe the gases that we were um, emitting ourselves us humans into the atmosphere, which are the same. Uh, we're going to continue that war, and we're going to have an impact. By 1988, uh, scientists were concerned enough to uh, ask for the for political action, and um, governments around the world decided to establish this intergovernmental panel on climate change to advise them on the issue of potential climate change. Um, and in 1992, there was a convention set up. Um, it was very much followed in the media, by the media, sorry, and you know, it was um, a big event. Um, and it is within this convention that climate change diplomacy occurs. Uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change is the full name. I'll just be referring to it as climate change. Um, the important thing with this is that um, there was a lot of goodwill and good words, uh, but no concrete targets as to what to do with these emissions that we knew uh, from some heavy work could uh, warm the climate and, and lead to potentially catastrophic uh, results. So immediately after the uh, convention was signed, which everybody was happy to sign, obviously, no, no targets, why not? Um, the negotiations started for a protocol. Um, and the, oh, sorry, for a protocol with legally binding targets, um, that's the Kyoto Protocol that um, we'll talk about in a sec. Um, but the convention already set out a few important uh, principles, and the most important I'll highlight is the 
principle common about differentiated responsibilities. So industrialized nations, which include all of the European Union, um, have been emitting for longer, and, then, and therefore, um, in particular at that time, represent a larger part of annual emissions, and they should take on a greater share of the burden to deal with this, with this issue of climate change. Um, that was established, that was uh, Article 2 of the, of the Convention. Uh, then developed countries were divided between those that were going to pay for the, for the others to uh, mitigate climate change and others that wouldn't. So you can imagine that uh, even though the Ukraine was considered an industrialized country, this happened right after the demands of the Soviet Union, um, they weren't asking the Ukraine uh, or any of the Eastern Bloc countries for a lot of money because they didn't have a lot, at least at the time. And so, to talk about leadership or being ahead or whatnot, we have to take into consideration well, our responsibilities. Uh, and this, this figure here um, represents what was um, considered in this climate convention to be, to be the, the indicators for responsibility in the climate change issue. So we've got here the accumulated emissions since the, let's say, the start of the second industrial revolution, so when emissions actually went up worldwide. And we see that clearly ahead uh, are the United States and the European Union, um, by far. China, this stops in 2002, and it, it is true that China, you will see after, has caught up, but there's, it, it, the EU and the United States have a healthy advantage. We're talking about, well, and that's revolution started in the UK, as we all learn in our textbooks, and ever since all those emissions, like, they have accumulated in the atmosphere, and they still have relevance for climate change today. So, um, now another question is per capita emissions, that's today's emissions. Um, here things look a bit different, and particularly we start seeing a big change already. So here is the five largest, um, the top five emitters, as they say, um, US, Russia, EU, China, and India. The US has been for a long time clearly at the top. Russia, which has a not very efficient economy, is uh, right there, per capita, we're talking about per capita emissions. And the EU has for a long time already been a comparatively efficient economy. Uh, Japan would score on similar terms. Uh, Australia, by the way, would be about, about there. And Qatar, Saudi Arabia, very bad. Okay? So we start see, seeing here that China, well, at the beginning when the convention was set up, um, was a fair way away from Europe, let alone the US. It started uh, catching up. And in this very report that I've taken the, the image from, they, they highlight that China, on per capita emissions, it's roughly on the same level as, as Europe. And what that implies for climate uh, mitigation into the future uh, and the responsibility for it. All these things cost money, so who's gonna, who's gonna pay? Or whose who's responsibility is it to leave? Um, finally, we've got absolute emissions. Absolute emissions, China, uh, I think it, the graph is pretty self-explanatory, um, but you know, there are three years for each country, and the last one at the bottom is the one that counts for today, and you can see the comparison with, with 1990 and 2000. Um, China has just had a meteoric rise in its emissions, and now it's way ahead of the United States or um, the European Union. You can see also a different graph here. Uh, the rise has been great, but um, as I said when I was explaining, the cumulative emissions are what actually contributes to climate change, something that I call factual responsibility. Um, However, a lot of those emissions occurred at a time when people did not really know that pumping CO2 into the atmosphere was going to have any adverse effects. Uh, maybe they knew that it might have some adverse effects in the immediate environment, 
that economy. No, nobody was dreaming of that, those results. So perhaps well, per capita emissions are more of a, represent more of an ethical responsibility. Now that you know what you're causing, what you're doing to the climate, your per capita emissions are still so high or so low. Um, but the truth is that a lot of the, a lot of the debate, a lot of the, um, um, a lot of the discussion revolves around absolute emissions. Um, usually, China gets uh, pops a lot of flack from you know, being the largest emitter uh, and not supposedly not doing too much. Um, another question is that a lot of the emissions from the United States and the EU have gone to China in the form of delocalized industry. So anyway, this is just to set uh, the stage for well, where we are, where we're at in terms of uh, responsibility. And now we can talk a bit about, about leadership and who's been proposing what. Uh, obviously, we could not expect leadership from, uh, say, um, Thailand or some other countries. I should have included the per capita emission policy. Um, now. As I said, the climate convention did not have any targets. So the real tough, the really tough discussions only started with the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, we had the convention in 1992, and immediately they start discussing, well, how we're going to do it to uh, get some substance into this convention. Um, and roughly from 1995 already, when they start meeting in Berlin, until the finals, Round of negotiations in 1997 in Europe, Japan, that went into history. Um, they were arguing um, back and forth, what shall we do? Um, and it is true that well, the EU had a great responsibility, but it is also true that it was pushing for higher targets than anyone else, um, high, much higher than the United States at the time. It had established its own burden sharing agreement within its among its, its countries. So the truth is that, for instance, um, Portugal was allowed to increase its emissions by up to 30%, whereas Germany had to decrease them by 25%. It was a what they call the EU bubble, um, which was a sort of small-scale um, climate convention just for the European Union. Within Europe, there are richer countries that have contributed much more to emissions and that can also afford to reduce those emissions and there are other countries that simply have not had the industrial development that, uh, that would have caused emissions and made them rich, etc. So they had their own agreement but towards the outside, on average, they were asking for higher targets than anyone else. Most notably because that's their benchmark of, benchmark of, of comparison more than the US, which was the other one right at the top. So what happened after these two years of negotiation is that um, overall developed countries, as I said, there was these two categories, developing and developed countries, that's it, no differentiations. Developing countries were not to take on any targets. Developed countries were, and they agreed on a 5.1% reduction respected to, respective of the 1990 levels. Each, each country, each region got different targets. Um, Australia was allowed to increase its emissions slightly. Um, so was Norway, for instance. The US and Japan or Europe had to, had to reduce their emissions. Europe had to reduce it by 8%, even though they were pushing for higher targets if everyone else was to come forward with, with, with other proposals. However, so this was at the time of the Clinton administration. Um, in the US. However, um, the US Senate at the time um, passed this resolution called Bert Hegel uh, after the name of the, the sponsors. And I've sort of cut through the, the jargon and um, all these verbose um, paragraphs. Basically, they did not want to sign anything that did not include China, where China was not uh, going to uh, be constrained to carry out emission reductions. And this 
um, was passed 95 to, to nil. Um, all Republicans and Democrats voted in favor of this resolution. So the government, Clinton and Al Gore, notably, um, had gone to Kyoto, signed a document that said that the US had to reduce its emissions, but by not too much. Um, but then they went home and they were faced with this. So what happened was, well, um, was a period that we might call the long wait, uh, where basically not much happened. Bush was elected and he basically withdrew from further Kyoto negotiations because, well, he saw the disappointments. Um, Kyoto was signed, it contained conditions that the US didn't accept. Uh, what was the point? It was, it was a fair call on the part of Bush, and also good for him because he really did not want to do anything about climate change. Um, at that point, um, well, at that point, when Bush officially announced that they were not going to negotiate anymore, um, the EU decided to say, okay, we will, we will continue negotiating with the rest of the world, we will make this happen. Why did they do that? Well, uh, you know, climate change was a, an issue that most Europeans agreed on. There was not a lot of climate skepticism in, in Europe. Um, it was an opportunity to show Europe's unity once more. They had done it once in, with the Kyoto Protocol and they were keen to continue so that they were not, no longer accused of probably have, have learned this already. It's, um, being this political dwarf. Um, um, and so the council passed a resolution in April 2004, uh, 2002 to ratify the Kyoto Protocol. Um, but um, the Kyoto Protocol could only start if, could, could only enter into force, more appropriate per se, after it was ratified by countries that accounted for over 50% of committed emission cuts. In plain language, that meant that um, seeing as the US was out, and that was a big chunk of emissions, pretty much everyone else had to sign up for it to, to have legal force. Um, and so the EU really put its, um, at least its diplomatic efforts behind, behind its, its rhetoric. Um, and started lobbying Russia, which was the, the key uh, nut to, to break. Uh, everyone else, Japan, uh, well, Australia wasn't doing it, but Australia was uh, not, not fundamental uh, in terms of emission uh, percentages. Um, Japan signed in, Canada was in, uh, Russia was the only one that, that was uh, holding out. And they wanted to buy. And, the EU did bargain with them. It was all about um, accession to the World Trade Organization. And I would be lying if I knew exactly what happened or how they did it. But everybody, commentators, uh, everyone agrees that uh, somehow they, 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 they reached an agreement. In, and uh, at the end of 2004, Russia ratified uh, the Kyoto Protocol. Um, they did not act as the World Trade Organization immediately. So I'm not sure what exactly the deal was, but um, with that obsession, um, the Kyoto process started. Now, again, this gets complicated with the dates and so on. They, when they, the protocol enters in force, then there is, obviously, with these legal documents, there's always waiting periods, at least in international diplomacy, there's always waiting periods. So the commitment period, the, the, the time that actually counts for the emission reductions, was going to be 2008 to 2012. So they thought, oh, we have plenty of time, this was 2005, to, to start negotiating more emission regime. It was already well known by then, 2005, that the commitments made at, um, at Kyoto um, were not enough. So it was again um, the EU, and notably um, the UK, Germany also was fundamental in that, that pushed for a, let's say, a clearer target. I mean, at Kyoto it had been, well, who, who is willing to reduce their emissions by a little bit? Please, please, just to, 
that didn't that didn't have anything to do with the science. That was five percent reduction from developed countries. It, it was just a random number, and it didn't have anything. It, it wouldn't have any impact. Uh, it seems like we're in 2012. We still don't have the, the emissions data. I think most countries have achieved their emissions reduction. But I mean, uh, worldwide emissions are still going up. It doesn't really matter. So they set out to um, uh, organize a consensus around this two degree target. Um, why two degrees? Well, roughly, it's the level at which impacts of climate change are managed. Uh, we've got sea level rise, uh, crop failures, sea level rise will, at two degrees, maybe the sea level rise stays within limits, so we can build sea walls. Uh, in terms of crop failure, well, temperatures rise, but still are not too hot for most crops, so that crops can still grow. You don't have to move production north something that you might have heard in relation to Australia, thinking about just moving production north and just shifting um, shifting agricultural production. With two degrees, it's, it is thought that we should need to do that. And so you can translate that, those two degrees, into a certain level of emissions. And basically, that translates to about 80% reduction for developed countries by 2050. Um, that's all, um, those are all uh, issues that the UK pushed at its um, conference on dangerous climate change in 2005. They brought it to G8, the UK, when it, when it was its presidency. Um, Germany also did. And at the, at, within the convention, uh, in the conferences of the parties, that's where all the parties to the convention meet, they started pushing um, for new, for for new commitments. Um, eventually, uh, the US um, was, as you know, through uh, the signature by Kevin Rudd of the Kyoto Protocol in 2007, uh, they were alone. That feels very bad, even if you um, have no uh, have no intention of doing anything about climate change, being alone on the climate change issue. Uh, it's something that diplomatically they couldn't take, and well, the, the EU can be credited with pushing everyone around to isolate the US. Um, so it's not so much leadership in actually tackling climate change, but uh, making the other big emitter <laughs> do something about it, which is not a bad first step, really. Um, so in, in 2007 in Bali, um, uh, a roadmap was set up to create a proper binding treaty to replace the Kyoto Protocol, uh, which, which would be, um, uh, this is wrong actually, COVID-19 in 2009, um, which would have as, a, well, as an objective this two degree Celsius. Um, fast forward to Copenhagen, probably, I mean, at the time, you know, media attention was pretty big as well, I'm sure you've all at least heard of it. Um, in mild terms, it was a bit of a failure, disaster. Um, not, they haven't done too much. That's the weakest formulation you can find. Um, most countries were still not ready to make significant commitments. Um, the US, even though President Obama had been elected then, uh, and he was uh, proponent of action on climate change, he hadn't been able to break the resistance of his own party and uh, most notably the, the Republicans against anything that would hurt the U.S. economy. Uh, defined so widely, obviously, yeah, it was it was hard to break that deadlock. Um, China was pointing at the U.S. and saying, "Well, look, if you remember that graph, in the U.S. 20 something percent of historical emissions, us maybe at the time nine." <laughs> if they're not doing anything, why, why should we? Uh, and all the time the US pointing at China and saying, well, look at your emissions, how they're rising. Um, the EU was basically standing there uh, not knowing what to do. Um, you can imagine, um, well, the EU did its homework, we'll see what the policies involved, but it proposed emission reductions that were in line with its own 
two degree target. Um, but no one else was ready to make any, any such proposal. So uh, in, in a diplomatic setting, where you, you come with, you show your cards and you say, oh, here's, here's my proposal, and then everyone else says, well, we're not sure. That's, that's how you get what you've got at Copenhagen. A political agreement, they called it. Um, it wasn't really even uh, a legally, it wasn't, it wasn't a legal document. Uh, it was just a, as if, we all hear from a piece of paper and write our names down there and say that we sort of agreed to these things, but with no, no commitment whatsoever. Um, it did state a two degree goal, this, this political agreement, but it didn't really mean much. Um, everybody sort of said what they were ready to do, which was clearly insufficient. Perhaps one of the uh, most positive aspects was that they acknowledged that what we need money to change things, and they agreed that $100 billion a year was something reasonable by 2020, but they kept pushing things out. And ever since, well, there's been more conferences of the parties, with much less media attention, you can imagine why, uh, people are disappointed and perhaps thinking, well, what's the point of um, uh, increasing expectations and then disappointing everyone else. Um, in Cancun, uh, COP16 in Cancun, simply endorsed Copenhagen, so they didn't really move forward beyond just legally backing the agreement. There was still a uh, so-called emissions gap, so they had the commitments um, and what they actually needed to reach. There was a clear emission gap, uh, em emission gap and everybody knew about it. They couldn't agree on well, who was going to take the, the next steps. Um, a few things that they did agree on are important, like the uh, requirements for monitoring, reporting, and verification. That's something that throughout the convention that has been the guidelines that ensure that everybody's talking about the same thing. We talked about emissions, but what do we talk about? How we're going to make sure that you all are reporting your emissions correctly and not just that, that we have moved forward in these 20 last years, uh, but obviously if we don't end up actually doing anything about with those figures, with that data, well, it's pretty useless. Um, the Green Climate Fund was set up to manage, potentially manage, those $100, million, $100 billion a year by 2020, but we still don't have the money, so there's not, there, there's not anything to manage. Um, and again, in Durban, they agreed, like they did in Bali, to have a timetable to reach a text that then would start with more delay in 2020. So um, the way things are today, Doha was the last one in 2012. Um, they didn't even, you know, have to. when they start saying, oh yeah, we'll do something in two years now, obviously the conferences in between, they happen every year, nothing much happens. Um, Doha is more or less uh, relevant because um, the Kyoto Protocol was expiring uh, at the end of 2012. The commitment period was 2009 2012. Um, and so the EU was, I think, sentimentally attached to it and pushed for a second commitment period, um, together with Australia, Ukraine, and Turkey. Um, the US, of course, they were not going to Kyoto, even with Obama. I mean, Kyoto had such bad connotations in the United States anyway that they were not going to go anywhere near it. Canada, Japan, and Russia said that. Let's stop with this game. I mean, if they, they adopted China's position, like, well, the US is not going to do anything, and, and China either. Why, why, should we play, why should we play this game? So, in the Kyoto 2, Kyoto Mark 2, um, there's just these uh, four countries dissipating, which make up 20% of global emissions, so symbolic. Symbolic. Um, and again, at Doha, we found that. Finance for this hundred billion a year um, is not it's not for not forthcoming. So that's the situation internationally. Um, the EU has been trying to convince mostly let's put it clear mostly the US that it has to take on responsibilities on paper. It's not that the US is not doing anything at all, particularly after Obama arrived. Things have moved in the U.S., but there is no real commitment to climate policy. 
that there is no over there. Um, it's all about energy security, energy independence, and if we can help the climate alongside, well, all the better. Um, now you look at China, for instance. Um, I guess they are. They have the, the moral upper ground. It's not their problem. They didn't create this problem. Um, a lot of their emissions populations are about a third of their emissions are actually from absorbing everybody else's industrial production and contaminating their own rivers and their own soil to produce for the rest of the world. So they're not willing to take any, any responsibility. So the EU, perhaps you now start seeing, the EU has been at the front. They, they've been trying to put this as an important issue on the table. But they haven't been leading in any common sense of the, of the word because, yeah, the, the pack that is behind them is not really moving much. And therefore, they're not moving much either. A lot of their commitments, we'll see, depend on everyone else doing something. And that's only logical as well. We'll see what, what the EU has done uh, now. Um, so again, let's, let me give you a, an idea of what, what, uh, what it is like for the EU to reduce its emissions. Um, already in the 1990s, so at the beginning of, of this whole discussion about climate change, um, what was called the dash for gas in the UK and, and German communication um, had reduced emissions of the EU as a whole because the UK and Germany are um, two largest emitters um, without any, any climate policy whatsoever. What happened was the UK, uh, now that Mrs. Thatcher has passed away, we can remember her by her um, closing down a few, a few mines in the, in the UK, which were pretty bad for the climate, and um, that led to a, this dash for gas. So emissions plummeted in the UK after, after the Thatcher years. Uh, and what happened with German reunification was basically that um, Germany, West Germany, absorbed um, um, the, uh, the East German economy and also sort of took responsibility for the emissions and what they did immediately after assuming responsibility for the economy of, of East Germany was shut down all these inefficient factories that had been running for the last 20 years. So their emissions, at least on paper, again, plummeted. But there was no connection to climate policy or whatever. And that is something that has been pointed out to the EU constantly from the very beginning. Uh, of you guys can very well argue for you know tougher emission reduction when you know your circumstances, your uh, structural issues already were conducive to, to a, re a reduction. Also, um, the EU is within major regions of the world um, one of the worst places for coal. Um, the EU does have coal deposits. Um, they lie dispersed all around the world, but it's one of the lowest quality uh, types of coal, lignite, and it's concentrated in a couple of countries yeah, within the EU. Poland, Germany, a bit, of Greece, a bit in Greece, uh, the UK, Spain, and others do have coal, but it's expensive to extract. It's the scenes and inaccessible. So, again, it was their own structural circumstances as well that pushed them away from the most polluting uh, of fossil fuels. Now, I'm sure you've heard this before, but obviously coal uh, is important in here, gas is important in here, because coal has twice as many emissions as, as gas. So that's also the explanation. Um, another structural factor, another circumstance of the EU was that, well, um, mass transit systems were already in place. Cars were already much more than anywhere else. They didn't have any heavy industry, uh, at least, for instance, in countries like the UK, had been pushed away. So this was the, the situation um, in the EU. Um, and before Kyoto, it is true that they were quite content with just with just that. Um, a carbon tax was proposed by the Commission. Um, the UK said no way. Um, 
mostly on, on ideological grounds. Uh, there's no way the EU is going to tax uh, the UK. Uh, but no one was willing to risk any political uh, credit on, on this on this tax proposal by the Commission. So it, it fell through. Um, they set up a couple of programs uh, for energy efficiency, save one of those wonderful backgrounds. I don't know what it stands for, but it's pretty straightforward. And then alternative, alternative energies. Um, the key here is that it had very, very limited funding. It was funding for feasibility studies. Uh, it was not to encourage massive deployment of uh, energy efficiency or, or, or renewable energy technologies. Um, it didn't do much. A few million euros per year. And we're talking about billions of euros now. Um, they sort of tweaked the rates um, for petrol and diesel, but they'd already been pushed up since the oil prices of the 1970s, so again, they couldn't really claim that that was a, a new climate policy that was coming up with. Um, so basically, there was a massive gap uh, between what they were saying um, just before Kyoto and at Kyoto uh, and the, their activities. Now, they obviously, they were told that at Kyoto and elsewhere, and they actually uh, got back together and I started doing things. Uh, the key, I guess, uh, policy document was the European Climate Change Program. This is not an institution or organization or anything, it's just a, a paper. But it did um, lay out what, what was to be the, the, the EU's climate strategy. Um, mostly, um, in 2000 already, it set much more stringent uh, efficiency standards for buildings, for large combustion plants, basically shutting down all polling efficient plants. Uh, it set up targets for renewable uh, energy generation. Um, and it led slowly and steadily to the setup of the emissions trading scheme um, in 2003. Um, that was the first major policy uh, basically anywhere in the world, apart from a few token taxes in Norway, uh, that was directly dealing, that was all about dealing with climate change. Um, and yeah, that was the EU doing it. So again, we do have a front runner there. Um, that was followed up by the Climate and Energy Package, which actually um, made the emissions trading scheme a bit more robust, and on top of that, it agreed to these very uh, catchy targets of 2020, 20% uh, increase in energy efficiency, uh, increase in renewable share, and reduction in emissions by 2020. Now, um, I'm not sure again what what, what follow. How long do we have left? We have about 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Okay. So I'm going to go through. Um, more like. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm just going to go very quickly through the emissions trading scheme. Um, basically, it's a, a market mechanism. There's many things you can do to tackle um, the, uh, the em to, to reduce the emissions in your economy. Um, the emissions trading scheme is a market-based mechanism because it's about capping and trading. So. Um, We've discussed this already, so I'm just going to go quickly through it. Um, so what is it? Um, it's about putting a cap on the em emissions that a large percentage of um, companies, firms, can use, um, which is slightly below the level that they have historically aimed at. So you're enforcing a reduction. Now, the trick is you're going to use allowances. So you're going to give to each company in whichever way, let's say just give for the moment, um, a number of allowances based on however much that company has emitted. Or in other circumstances, however much that company is willing to pay, however much they think 
they're going to emit. So they'll buy those or not. Or maybe they will get hit. The point is that each company has allowances that should, at the end of the period, be equivalent to their emissions. Now, if a company, looking at their production and their emissions and so on, sees that they're not going to have any, enough allowances, they might try to buy allowances from another company that can reduce its emissions and therefore will not need as many allowances. That's the whole trading system. And that's how you get a price. So firm A needs allowances. It goes to firm B, who doesn't need as many allowances, and therefore gets charged by firm B. Well, however much firm B has spent in reducing its own emissions. Sometimes they don't even need to spend a lot, so it's basically whatever price. But on, on, on paper, it's, this is determined by firm B um, diminishing its emissions by uh, $5 a ton, 5 euros a ton, say. So firm B will, ch will charge firm A $5 for those extra allowances. And at the end of the day, at the end of the period where these things are calculated, they will both submit as many allowances as they have emissions. And there's very clear monitoring rules that say, okay, we're going to put actually physical um, measuring devices at the, at the, on the stack of a particular power plant or company. So that there is a clear verification of how many emissions they, they have. Made. And there were obviously penalties for those that didn't comply in the registry and so on. Now what happened was, um, everybody gave too many allowances away. The point is to have a cap that is below the level so that people are interested in buying and selling these, these allowances. If you put the cap too high and everybody gets too many allowances, they're useless. And that's exactly what happened in the EU. So yeah, they're not perfect. They set up this system and it failed miserably in what they call the uh, trial phase. That was the first phase and let's say that it was a learning learning base and yeah, they learned that you couldn't leave um, the um, let me just stop here. they couldn't leave this allocation of allowances to the states. Um, so what happened with the climate and energy package is I've already said that they agreed to these twenty percent uh, targets and so on. Obviously one of them is reduction uh, in emissions, which was supposed to be achieved through the emissions trading scheme, but they, they thought, well, if it keeps on going like, like it has before, it won't happen. So they managed to introduce a centralized cap. Um, they already had better data because they had been gathering all these data, which is also a policy decision. I mean, you have to uh, establish the, the mechanisms to collect that data and then be able to uh, enforce that on companies. That's already an advancement. And there were harmonized rules for allocation. Like you couldn't just ask a national government to go and say, well, I think my companies deserve these many allowances. No, no. The commission would go and say, what is this company? Steel maker. Uh, what, what have they, how many emissions have they had in the past? What is the um, situation across the sector? Benchmarks, etc. So with the climate and energy package, they sort of tightened the screws on the emissions trading scheme. Um, they increase the, the amount of up auction. So I've said before there were two ways of doing it. I mean, you can just give them the allowances or make them pay first for the allowances and then trade. On paper, those two things should be the same. At the end of the day, no one will be made better off uh, or worse off. But um, the fact was that when companies were being given the um, allowances for free, um, well, sometimes they were selling them directly, which was a profit for them, and also charging the consumers, which was the thing that you know, they wanted to prevent by, by giving allowances for free. You've seen this in Australia, if you've, ever, if you've followed the debate at all about admissions training scheme, everybody was crying for free allocation, and consumers were also given some tax credit. But the point is that, well, you're given that tax credit or that free allocation so that you reduce your emissions and it doesn't cost you much or, or anything at all. But they were not reducing their emissions, selling those allowances, uh, making money overall, went for profits all over. And 
well, at least for the electricity sector, they sort of ruled that out and managed to counter the lobbies, uh, the many lobbies, trying to prevent auctioning from happening, and it will eventually happen. So, conclusions already. Um, the EU has made some significant moves towards tackling climate change. Sorry, Colin um, Brown. But it has not convinced all this. Um, so, again, more of a front runner than a leader. Um, partly, this has been because, for many different reasons, the EU has found it supposedly relatively easy to reduce emissions. Um, so it set itself a goal of 20% in 2009. By 2012, it was already at 17.5. Why? Well, nobody was thinking about the global financial crisis at the time. Um, but then now people say, oh, look at your targets. You're already there almost. Is that a tough target? Well, at least they had, I can tell you, that's the topic of my PhD, there were really intense negotiations about getting a target making it worthwhile. They're talking about 30% targets now. And they, they always were, in the case of an international agreement, the target was always going to be risen to, uh, raised to 30%. And obviously nobody else uh, went along. So, um, And also, importantly, it has, the, the area where it's probably been the most successful, uh, it has been deploying renewable energy. Uh, you can, Look at a few countries like Germany, uh, Spain, Denmark. Um, they've been extremely successful in deploying wind power, um, deploying solar power. Uh, wind power now makes up 30% um, of um, generation in, in Spain, electricity generation. Um, whereas a couple of decades ago it was in zero. Um, that doesn't happen for free. Uh, and, well, um, that partly, it's probably not wind, it's more solar subsidies are weighing down, for instance, um, the Spanish budget, uh, which, as you may have heard, is a bit of a problem now. Um, so, yeah, Europeans have seemed to easily achieve these targets, and maybe they don't have such, um, they don't have a uh, right to brag about them or push others towards stricter targets. But it is true that they've also, you know, um, pay for them and um, spent a good deal of political time um, arguing and, and trying to devise ways to tackle climate change, whereas others, notably the US for many, many years, they just seem to avoid the issue as much as possible. And with that, that's it. Um, we'll have some QA time. This time for about two or three questions, perhaps? Yes? If you could give your name also and... Uh, okay. If you could also give your name... A Hank. A Hank Van Loon. Uh -huh. You know, is my name. Uh, immigrant. Could you say something about, and you already alluded to this, the sort of double-edged sword. You've got the United States on the one hand, where politically, because of the nature of the internal economic system and so forth, it's very difficult to come to a political position and join it, you know, where the European Union has much more time to discuss sophistication debate, as, as opposed to China, where there's a double-edged sword, supposedly. You know, on the one hand, there's no democracy, there's no ground rule or ground swelling debate, and so it is a more corporate, state corporate decision that they could or should make. Uh, and yet, you know, China is, uh, is still got a hell of a long way to go. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so, as far as then China is concerned, you know, uh, do you think that uh, their, their, their capacity to actually uh, reduce emissions you know, considering they still use vast quantities of coal mm -hmm. and they opening power stations mm -hmm. once, one a week. Mm -hmm. So the United States position is political, we understand. To what extent is the China one also political? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, I have a proposal. Maybe we could take all the questions together because we're running out of time. Okay. Yeah. Maybe is there another Any question? Any other questions? Change increases, you're not sure what you increase in the degree you reach it. 
Mm -hmm. So a lot of the climate change stuff that we're doing now is how to deal with the loss of crops and the climate change refugees and all of that. Mm -hmm. And from that, I also wonder, like with your question, whether it's, I mean, Australia's up there with climate change because it's individuals, like, you have a look at the industry or the individual people that are doing the most producing of CO2 emissions. In Australia, from what I've read, it's individuals. I think it's similar with the US, whereas China, it's industry that are producing yeah, that would be. the so, right. so you're tackling two very different, I guess, topics or ways. Way. Mm. So well, what is the question? Um, well, my question was just, is, is it true, like, the whole Australian, America versus mm -hmm. China, that it's individuals in, in Australia and... So whether there is more difficulty in tackling emissions in Australia because you have to go to well, every single person that has a right to vote and not be as happy, whereas in China you kind of say, oh, close down these factories. Is it, am I guessing more or less what you mean? Yeah, pretty okay. much. Okay. Like, is it true that it is? Let me try and, and, and answer those questions about China and the US. It is true, I mean, it's always been said, okay, uh, China is a command and control economy still to a great extent. Uh, they've embraced capitalism where and how it suits them, which is great, maybe we should do the same, where and how it suits us. But um, the Chinese mm, government is not as monolithic as it appears from the outside, perhaps. I mean, my thesis used to be about China. So I, I did research a fair bit about them. And you'd be surprised how decentralized and how independent from the central guidelines um, developments are in China. Developments like setting up a power station. It's not like, you know, uh, Xi Jinping or Hu Jintao, you know, sign off every single power plant in the country or anything remotely similar. And their guidelines are so general. And yes, they, they do have the capability for this, um, you know, one-off actions in saying, okay, we, we're missing our own targets. And this happened. We're missing our own targets for energy efficiency. That, that shall not happen. And it did not happen. They shut down factories throughout the country. Um, at a great cost of massive <laughs> disruption just because they were missing their own target. That's why they're very careful not to engage into any negotiation of targets as well. They, they, they don't like fudging targets. And also they know they don't have very um, sophisticated tools to the, deal with them. I guess they're even more aware than Europeans and Americans that of, of, of the reality that managing an economy is not you don't have levers. You, 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 it's, it's, not, um, it's not as precise as that. You may set directions, guidelines, like with the UETS, the emissions rate scheme. Yeah, there is a sort of, it sets a general direction for things to go towards less emissions, but you can't really rely on that to deliver everything you want. And I guess, um, whereas we tend to consider China as yes, um, hierarchical system and so on. For some things, yeah, I mean, you can command your soldiers to do certain things. Okay, sure. Um, they might be able to go to war more easily than another country, perhaps. But reduce their emissions, it's perhaps not the same. They're probably in a similar situation to um, any other. And also, they have to deal with the fact that their own internal structures are also quite weak in terms of. And having, um, here I'm reading off what Chinese scholars have told me that um, you need to have capable people at all levels. They have very capable people in the top 5-10%, and it's such a huge country. You have to have people that are aware of any energy issues, that have the big picture in every tiny little place where they're going to set up a power station. Well, that in China is a phenomenal challenge. And for instance, the US doesn't have that kind of challenge. They could really, I mean, they have the, if you want, the human resources to deal with it. Um, the problem in the US, I think, is that there is a very strong belief that, and it's a belief, so it's hard to break that 
you know, climate change will either sort, it, sort itself out um, because God will come and save us all. <laughs> Some sort of argument along those lines. Or they just think that it's a conspiracy by, I don't know, thousands and thousands of scientists all around the world somehow pushing in the one direction to, you know, screw it, to screw America over. Um, it's very hard to deal with that. And, yeah, I don't have the answer to it. How, how they will do it, um, but I would I would risk saying that yeah, um, in China it's it's perhaps less political. Just to answer your question, it's less political as you know simply structural. They just don't have the, the manpower or the, the human resources to deal with it. In the U.S. is a crisis of will, and yeah, a, a simply a completely different mindset. Um, to to what might might have prevailed in Europe. Um, I hope more or less your questions have been answered, even if it's in a roundabout way. <coughs> and I think I have to leave the stage for yes, Lisa. So, so this is the last question. Thank you very much, and also uh, we've learned a lot not only about the EU but also the US and um, China and so on and so on. And uh, if you want to know more. Uh, Alfonso is on the fifth floor where the manager of the Indian Center is, and uh, if he's not too busy with writing the end of his PhD, he might have some time to talk to you this way. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Alfonso. Thank you.